So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back for the second day of the Distributed Computing Seminar. Today we'll be more into the real material for the course, uh, because today we're actually going to discuss MapReduce itself. To motivate MapReduce, we're going to talk about the functional programming uh, idioms that MapReduce uh, encompasses in a distributed setting. So MapReduce drew its inspiration from functional programming languages like Lisp and ML. And there are many features of these languages that are common across them, even with their differing syntaxes. So in the next few slides, we're going to uh, briefly review some of that and then talk about some of the list processing mechanisms that are used in functional programming languages that became the basis for the MapReduce uh, structure. So there are basically a few things we have to remember when dealing with functional programming and how this differs from imperative programming languages like Java or C++. And first and foremost is that functional operations don't modify any data structures. They always create new ones, creating copies of the data to represent the updated form. What this means is that the original data still exists in its unmodified form. So if we have multiple uh, components of a program which are operating on the same starting data, they don't need to be synchronized when one uh, of these subtasks has updated the data because the updated data is actually reflected through a new copy. What this means is that the data flow is actually implicit in the program design because anytime we create new data that we want to keep, we have to assign a new name to it. And finally, this boils down to the order of operations um, across a piece of data don't matter because each of the different operations are making their own copies to work from. So in a more concrete example, we can have some function over a list of integers. And this function might return a value representing the sum of all of these data elements plus the product of all these data elements plus the length of the list itself. And what is, uh, what is key about these are that none of these functions have any side effects. They're all what we refer to as pure functions. So whereas side effects refer to things such as printing to the screen, getting user input, uh, or writing to disk or network, pure functions are simply express a mathematical computation, much like the functions that you learned about in algebra. So knowing that sum, mole, and length are all pure functions, we can evaluate them either left to right or right to left. Or if we felt like being very clever, we could actually put these uh, in three separate threads that run at the same time and have all their results simply get joined back together at the end. And so while it's kind of obvious that functions like sum and mole across a list are not going to modify the list because they're transforming a list, so to speak, into an integer, there are other functions that look as though they actually modify data structures. The append function, for example, would be appending some value x to the end of the list LST. And so you might get concerned that when we want to append to the list, we're going to modify the list itself. However, as we can see in the slide, LST is abandoned after the second line. Reverse of LST returns to us a new list, LST prime. And so we've got new data with a new name that we are passing into the next computation, which puts x on the front of the list. Uh, double colon is an operator in ML for uh, prepend. And then reverse the order of that list. Again, actually, this list is going to be separate from the one that is returned by the second call to reverse, uh, just to make that clear. So by creating a new name for the data, we've made the data flow explicit in the program. And the final point from functional programming that we want to remember is that functions themselves can be used as arguments to other functions. Um, as a side point, functions can also be returned uh, from other functions, but that doesn't really directly apply to MapReduce. So the function listed here on the screen is called do double, which will take some function which it binds to the name f, applies that function to the initial argument x, and then applies f again to the result of that. So if we have a function that 
that takes an argument named z and multiplies it by 2, do double of f and some value will obviously uh, multiply that value by 4. Can anybody give me the type of uh, the function do double? You. So alpha arrow alpha cross alpha. Alpha arrow alpha. Very good. So can you tell me what alpha means here? Yes, alpha is a polymorphic type. And the way that we read this, again, is alpha to alpha, cross alpha, all of that to alpha. So cross means that we have taken two arguments. So this is the type for f, and this is the type for x. And then after the arrow is the return type. And what this means is we have some type, and we don't really know what this type is. All we know is that we're using it in four different places, and it all has to be the same. So this function here clearly operates on integers, because we're taking z times 2. So this is a function of type int to int, because this is an int, and then the return type is another int. So if this is being used for f, we have some function int to int, and its argument necessarily has to be an integer, because that's what it takes. And since the return type of this function is an integer, and do double is returning what that returns, the return type of the entire comprehension is also an integer. We could also use this on any other type, like strings. For example, we could take some function which takes a string and, I don't know, concatenates it with itself. So that would take a function type string to string, which would also fit into the alpha to alpha pattern. It's just that it's a different alpha than when we would use it with an integer. So that's it for the basics of functional programming principles. Functional programming also has associated with it something of a standard library. Um, the names of these functions will be slightly different from language to language, either Lisp, Scheme, ML, Haskell. But just like how both Java and C Sharp have a set of classes which mean more or less the same thing with slightly different names, in functional programming languages, there are also a set of common uh, functional paradigms that we see uh, that, that crop up with, with similar names. Functional programming, in particular, operates on a lot of lists. So that's what most of these functions have to deal with. And two of the most general and abstract of these functions are referred to as map and fold. So what map does is it takes some function f, and it operates f across each element of a list. And it returns the list that comes from taking these individual applications of f in order. So if we have a list of elements which are represented by the type green circle, we can apply f to some value and get back some value of a different type. And we can do this for each of the different elements in the list, and they're represented in order in the output list. It's important to realize that this type has nothing to do with this type. It's just the types of all the outputs have to be consistent, and the types of all of the inputs have to be consistent. So whereas map is something that we would call an end-to-end -end transformation, because we take n input elements and get back n output elements, each of them arranged in a, li in a list, fold is something that we call an end-to-one transformation, because we take a list of n input elements and we return one output element. For this reason, fold is also referred to sometimes as a reduction operator. So the way that fold works is, Whereas with map, we simply had f and lst as arguments, fold is going to take this extra argument, which I refer to as x0. And fold is going to take an element of the input list and pass it into f along with that initial value x0. So the type of the thing in the list has nothing to do with the type of x0. However, f's return type has to be the same as x0. It will then take that output and combine it with the second element in the list to produce another value, which is then carried forward until we finally run out of list, at which point the value that f returns is the final value for the entire comprehension. 
The name for the values being passed through as intermediate data are referred to as accumulators. So the type of fold is more complicated than the type of map because it takes some alpha, which is to say the thing in the list, and some beta, which is the thing that we are threading through. And we finally return the last beta after uh, comprehensioning over an entire list of alphas. Can we still return a list through fold, though? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Good. Most people think yes. And that's good because whereas we have some single return type, which we're calling beta, nothing prevents that from just being some gamma list. It's just that a single list is being built up over the entire process, as opposed to taking a bunch of discrete values and uh, making a list out of all of them. So if we were going to implement fold, there are two different ways we could do so. And these two ways reflect on the fact that whereas map doesn't really matter whether we go left to right or right to left, in fold, it, would, it matters a great deal to the output value depending on how we phrase our function f that we are folding through the list. So in SML, we call these functions fold L and fold R, which stand for fold left to right and fold right to left, respectively. So fold L of some value or some function f, some accumulator A, and the empty list just returns A. If we're going to fold across some list that has elements, which is how you read x double colon xs, which is to say a list that matches the pattern some head element uh, prepended onto some rest of the list, is we fold, again, f along with this new value substituted for a across the rest of the list. And we get this new value by running our function f on the current head of the list and the current accumulator. Fold r works pretty much the same way, however, um, we have to apply f to x and the accumulator gained from already having traversed the right portion of the list. So does it matter if we use fold L or fold R to implement sum? No. And that's because sum is associative, right? We can apply it on either, in either direction. Can anybody think of, an, of a function that would not be associative that we might want to run on a list? Cons. Why would we want to run cons on a list? Because you can reverse it. So if we wanted to write some function to reverse a list, we could write this by using a very simple fold. We say fold from left to right a function of a list element x, the accumulator a, which maps to x cons on to the front of a. Our initial accumulator is going to be just an empty list. And obviously, the list that we're folding over is the list that we passed into LST. So if we were to actually run this example on some list 1, 2, and 3, what would happen is we would take the empty list, which is our initial accumulator, and we would also take this as our first value of x, and we get x constant to the empty list, or just 1. And then this would be the accumulator a when 2 was x. So 2 constant to this gives us this list. And obviously, the final step is going to give us the reversed list. So here's back to our initial example. Can anybody want to take a stab at writing one of these functions? Anybody at all? Black marker. Okay. Okay. Uh, the M 
empty list was like this? I couldn't remember. Sure. Sorry? How do you represent the empty list? Um, the empty list is just uh, two squares. Good. Yes, that would totally work. So, okay, um, that's that is correct because if we sum over the empty list, we're going to get zero. Or summing over some pattern match list, uh, we would just get that. Um, I was kind of hoping for a use of fold though, uh, but that's okay. Um, so an alternate way of writing this is just to say that. We would fold us something. We'd have to be folding some function, right? And the function is going to be on a list value and an accumulator. And we're just going to sum the list value and the accumulator. So the accumulator for the empty list is going to be 0. And the list that we are compositing over is going to be LST. So this has the, ex the recursion actually explicitly built into the sum function, whereas this uses it inline through fold. So what fold represents is a factoring out of this recursion across an entire list. And we can compactly represent all three of these functions uh, using very similar final methods over fold. So to change sum to multiply, we just switch the plus to a times. And instead of starting with 0, we use 1. And then if we wanted to take the length of the list instead of the sum of the elements, we would just completely ignore the argument x and just use a 1 for each element. So there's a more complicated example of things we can do with fold. How might we generate a list of partial sums? So the input list here has a list of numbers, and the output list shows how many integers have been summed together before that point. So 0 elements, 1, 1 plus 4 is 5, 5 plus 8 is 13, etc. So to start with, we are obviously going to need our regular header. And then we're obviously going to want to fold, because that's the topic of the lecture, right? And then we have some big function here, right? So what we would want to do is take the next element of the input list, and we want to somehow combine this with the first element of the list that we're folding through, right? Because we're building up an output list. So we already know that our accumulator is going to start out as an empty list. And we can pattern match the output list by saying it has some head element composited with a tail. And if we wanted to just put this sum on the front, we can say, well, the sum is going to be x plus a. And then we want the rest of the list on there. So. We put the whole list back. And clearly, this fold is going to be running across our list. Does this look right to everybody? Uh, he's asked if the accumulator is the, is the, uh, is the nil here. And yes, the accumulator is the empty list.
So it's been pointed out the empty list will not actually match this pattern here. So we can just simply cheat and by saying that we're going to start with a list with some element in it. If we wanted to get rid of that element, we could simply pull it out at the end. Or we could have avoided that by writing a much more complicated function in the middle that actually did the pattern matching. So now are we fixed? It's, and everybody asks, isn't it backwards? And they are totally correct. If you continually cons onto the front of a list, you're actually going to be building it up backwards. So our two options at this point are we could either use fold r, which would go from right to left. But because that's not tail recursive, we might not want to do that. Or we could simply put this entire thing in parentheses and reverse it. So this is an example of how to think in terms of building up output lists in terms of input lists. As a more complicated example of map, what if we wanted to do some strange operation on a set of words uh, like this, where we reverse the whole list and then re-reverse the words? And using just the functions that we've learned so far, we can't actually do this. But if we have two new functions, which we can call explode and implode. then we can do this function in the set of the following stages. So stage one would be to map each element to its reverse. So we can map some function on a string in the list, which we can call s, to so we can take the, we can take the, sorry? Implode, reverse, explode. Implode, reverse. Implode, reverse, explode. He's got it. Implode of reverse of explode of S. One, two. And again, we would do that across. LST, and then, so what this so what this will do is we will take some string s, explode it into a character list, reverse the character list, and turn it back into a string. And then for phase two, we just reverse this entire list around. So how many maps does this actually use? Anyone want to take a stab? So there's, there's one map in this function, which is actually explicitly laid out. But how many folds are there? See, hand for three. And it's either three or four, depending on how you count. Because reverse impl and implode can both be implemented with fold. And if you think slightly more creatively over the implementation of strings themselves, that's also a fold operation. So we can create a whole variety of higher level functions by building on top of this fold primitive. So compared to the implementation of fold, the implementation of map is actually pretty straightforward. The map across the empty list is the empty list itself. And the map of f across some list that has both a head element and a tail is the function applied to the head element prepended on the list created by building up the rest of the tail. But what this does is it moves left to right across the list. And since we said we're in a functional setting, 
we can't have any side effects in our function f. What that means is that it doesn't really matter which elements we apply f to first, because there's no way for one instance of f to actually affect what would happen the next time f is run on some other input element. Consequently, we can take map and parallelize it going straight down from, if we go back to this slide, oh, this slide. We could actually parallelize this process by mapping several circles to squares all at one time, confident that the construction of f in a functional manner prevents them from interfering with one another. So as I just said, this is really the secret behind how MapReduce gets parallelism across a distributed setting. The functions that you write for the mapper have to be written in such a way that they don't communicate with one another. They are effectively side effectless uh, with respect to the total computation. OK. So this is all the background that we're going to see from functional programming. And now we're going to move more into MapReduce itself. So the motivation for designing MapReduce was that they have, at Google, large problems involving giant data sets, sometimes larger than a terabyte of data as input. And this pr processing clearly is not going to happen on a single machine. It's going to take several hundred or maybe a few thousand CPUs to crunch a terabyte of data in any reasonable amount of time. And they wanted to make this process easy for programmers to do. So MapReduce was developed as a framework to provide this automatic parallelization and distribution. So whereas we saw in the example of the sum function that we can use fold to factor out the recursion of, uh, across a list, we can use MapReduce itself to factor out all of the important parts of a distributed system under the hood, allowing programmers to focus on writing just the functions that are doing the interesting computation. So among the other features that MapReduce provides are fault tolerance, because as I said yesterday, if we have 1,000 computers, one of them is going to probably be crashing or having a faulty network card at any point in time. And it also provides things like status and monitoring tools so that people can keep tabs on their computation without having to reinvent the wheel each time one of these features is needed in some other distributed process. So by this point, these functions should look very familiar. Map is going to take some input value, and it's going to produce some output values as a result of that. And MapReduce is going to work, instead of just on a regular list of values, as on a list of key value pairs. So each map function is going to take some input key and input value, and it's going to return one or more output values with their own, or I should say intermediate values, with their own output keys. The reduce function then takes all of the intermediate values for a given output key and creates a list of final values that have been created by the aggregation through them. So I said before that fold was a reduction operator because it goes from n values down to 1. Um, and here it looks like we're actually not really doing that sort of reduction because it says out value list uh, on the slide. But as we also pointed out, fold itself can build up a list as a single output value. So from the systems programmer side of things, they think it looks more general to explicitly write that we can create a list of output values. From the programming language type theorist side of things, it looked more general for them to just simply write beta and say that everybody knows that a beta is equal to some gamma list. But of course, some gamma list can also just be a list of one element. So which is more general to you uh, is really a matter of opinion. So the values that are fed into the mapper are some kind of records from some data source. They can either be lines out of a file, entire files tagged by the file name, rows out of a database, etc. And each of these input values comes with it some sort of input key. And the mapper is going to produce in intermediate values created by processing 
this input list that they've received along with multiple output keys, which might not necessarily uh, be correlated with the input key. After the map phase is over, all of the different intermediate values from all of the different mappers are collected together, sorted by key. And the reducer is going to take all of the intermediate values for one of these keys and uh, turn that into its final value or list of values. So to see all of this graphically, we have a set of mappers across the top, which are each being fed from some different data stores. These data stores could be files, could be database tables, etc. And each map process is going to create a set of intermediate values tagged by different intermediate keys. The barrier is a synchronization mechanism that we didn't cover yesterday, which just waits for all of the processes on one side of it to reach the barrier. So if we have n processes, then when they start checking in with the barrier, it has a counter that starts at n and goes down to 0. And after the counter hits 0, it unblocks all of the tasks at once. But when we hit the barrier, we aggregate the intermediate values together. So these values are all for key 1. These values are all for key 1. They all get shuffled into one reducer. If these values and these values are for key 2, those go to this reducer, etc. So the key point to realize in this process is that the maps and the reduces are not straight through pairs. The barrier in the middle that invokes the shuffling process is allowing us a sort of designated point in our system at which these multiple threads uh, can communicate through the shared intermediate key space. So the parallelism that gets created by MapReduce comes from the fact that all of these different map functions are running in parallel, and they're using totally different input data sets. So since each mapper can't see the other input data sets, there's no synchronization between them. They just start writing their output values and can be run in separate address spaces. The reduce functions can also be run in parallel because the output keys are constrained to be working on separate data sets. This reducer here, which is working on final key 2, cannot see any of the values that are going into final key 1. So the only bottleneck in this process, I'll get to that in one second, the only bottleneck in this process is that the reduce phase can't start until the map phase is completely finished. Question in the back. Back one slide. Uh, the question is, do, if we have uh, a whole bunch of mappers across the top, does the entire process have to wait for all of the mappers uh, to finish before we can start any reducer? And the answer is yes. Um, in a few slides, we'll discuss that actual issue a bit more and how they made that more efficient. So as an example of a map reducible process, imagine that we have some set of documents and we want to count how many times a whole bunch of words appear in these documents. So each map process gets an input key and an input value, and the input key is a file name, and the input value is the contents of that file. And the mappers are going to turn the input file into a series of words, and for each word, they're going to use the word as an intermediate key and the value 1 as its intermediate value for that key. So if we have something that says like my dog Sam, it would output my one dog one Sam one. Then the reducer is going to take these output keys, which are the words, and an iterator over all of these values. In this case, all of the values for a given word are going to be one. And it's going to sum all those values up into the result and emit that final number as the word count for that word. So two notes to remember here is that each word counting reducer does not care about or even see any of the other words that are being reduced in parallel. And another note is that there are no ordering guarantees on the values being reduced. This iterator is only over this random collection of ones. And if we had slightly more structured data that we wanted to have in a ordered form, the reducer itself would be responsible for sorting those values and applying, uh, and applying its 
computation to the sorted set. So obviously, this example isn't completely right. Um, for one thing, it's not written in any real programming language. It's just in pseudocode. The actual implementation of MapReduce used here at Google is written in C++ in a library that has bindings to both Python and Java. And the actual code for a MapReduce process would involve more code at the startup that actually defined where these values are coming from and how they're being broken out to the different mappers. However, um, the pseudocode on the previous slide is the crux of the whole computation. So up to this point, we've been presenting MapReduce primarily from a programming language's point of view. We use functional programming to, mo to motivate how the map and the reduce functions are designed. Um, at this point, the lecture is going to switch gears, and we're going to talk about the systems and implementation side of the MapReduce uh, mechanism. So one of the most important things, as I said, in a distributed system is realizing that we're designing on top of a network. And when we're going to design on top of a network, we always want to minimize the amount of bandwidth that we actually use. So MapReduce is going to instantiate the different mapping threads on the same machines that actually have the data. Because, as I said, the mappers can't see the data being given to a different map process, and none of the mappers can cross-communicate, it does not matter which particular instance of map gets a given piece of data. So the mappers are actually run on machines that have been selected because the data started out on those machines. There's no reason to move data from some storage machine to a different machine to do the computation just to move it back. And if we can't get a mapper running on the same machine, for example, there's already a map process running on that machine, then it tries to only have it on the same rack. So yesterday I drew a diagram on the board where I showed how you could use a sort of hierarchy of switches and routers to eliminate um, cross traffic. And that's how they actually do implement it in MapReduce. The map tasks are also usually chunked to a particular size that already works with their file system. We'll learn more about how the Google file system works uh, in, two, in Thursday's lecture. Another point that I discussed earlier and so that MapReduce guarantees is a degree of fault tolerance. So if we're going to be running a process across 1,000 computers, there's a good chance that one of these is going to fail. For example. So what we want to do is we can't let a whole terabyte of computation get thrown away because some 10 kilobytes of it at the bottom had some bad values in it. So if a, if a task gets crashed, we're going to re-execute it. Why do you think that we would execute both the completed map tasks and the in-progress ones? Why, would we, why wouldn't we just do the in-progress tasks? Exactly. He says the results from the completed task might be lost because the server is inaccessible. So as I said yesterday at the end of the slides, if we have a bunch of sequence numbers and a bunch of acknowledgments, we know that we have gotten some portion of, their, of the data to wherever it's going. However, there's no guarantee that all of the data has been transferred to where it needs to be. Meaning that if a map task completes and there's data on that mapping server that needs to get pulled to reducing machines, if the mapper goes down, then the rest of the data on that server hasn't been spread out to the reducing functions. So we have to re-execute the map task on a different machine so that that data becomes available. We only need to re-execute the in-progress reduce tasks because the reducers are usually hooked up to a permanent and replicated storage mechanism. So a reducer is only going to claim that it is completed after its results have been verifiably backed up to several different locations. Another point for fault tolerance, as I said, is that if particular input keys and values are causing a, a particular mapper to crash, we don't want that to stop the entire process. So if we were, for example, counting lines in files, we might have written our function really stupidly so that empty files with no lines in them whatsoever uh, cause a null pointer. And we wouldn't want one empty file to screw up a line count across 50,000 documents. So if a particular map task, or I should say a particular map input, causes a crash on several different machines, eventually MapReduce is just going to give up on that piece of the input set and will allow the partial computation to complete uh, with a warning message that it couldn't get all the files through. 
As an, in, as an interesting software engineering side effect of this, this can actually work around bugs in third-party libraries that you don't have access to the source code for. So if you have some library that has a little bug in the middle that you can't fix, well, you don't want to throw away all your data or have to go hunting through three terabytes of data to find what's causing a little crash. Instead, you can just know that the system will disregard things that it can't handle while providing you with the best result that it can across the data that it can. And of course, if we're going to be designing some high performance distributed system, we're going to want to perform a lot of optimization to make sure that this happens as efficiently as possible. So a question was raised earlier, doesn't it seem like a really bad idea that if we have 5,000 map tasks, a single slow one can hold up the other 49.99 of them? And yes, that's a big problem. However, because we have uh, 1,000 machines available to us, we can reuse those spare cycles on a machine that's already completed its initial map job. So if we get to the point where there's only 20 map functions or 20 instances of the map function left to run, we can run those across four different machines each. And whichever is the first copy to finish is the one that gets to actually use its results. The way that this becomes possible is because MapReduce is controlled by a single master server. So the single master server has a scoreboard in it that keeps track of which map tasks have been completed and which particular map uh, machine is responsible for delivering those results to the reducers. So when a given mapper completes, it tells the master that it's done, and the master is synchronized so that if two mappers come back at once, only one of them is going to win and the others will be disregarded. So can anybody see another optimization that we might be able to do? Yeah, question? Sure. So the question is, do you need to wait for every map task to finish or simply every map task for a particular key? And uh, the answer comes from the fact that there is no map task for a particular key. If we go back to our diagram here, we have a set of input keys being mapped. However, each one of these can provide values to a different output key. And we don't know which is which. At this point, we might say, though, well, why don't we just make these iterators lazy? And if we start, we can just start reducing as soon as some values are ready. And all we can say is there are no more values after all the mappers are done, right? So if we have a reducer that exhausts all of the uh, values that have been iterated to it so far, it can then just block until more values get put in. Um, that having been said, there are a number of reasons why it would be disadvantageous to implement this. First and foremost, if we have a whole bunch of machines, there's no good reason for us to run reducers on these machines and mappers on these machines we actually would want to be running mappers across all of the machines we have available to us to get this going as fast as possible. So that means that if we started the reduce tasks while there were still map tasks running, we would then be taking processor time from the mappers for the reducers. So we're really just putting the cycles into a different place, which isn't much faster. Another possible example is that there might, another possible reason is that there might not be enough bandwidth to be running both maps and reduces at the same time. If we're still feeding input data to mappers, we don't want that to get slowed down because we're already shuffling data to reducers. Um, and finally, there's a system complexity problem uh, that comes into effect here. Remember how I said that it's possible for mappers to crash and that loses the data that comes from that particular map instance, which means that we then run a new instance of that mapper and put its results to the iterator, to the, to the iterators in the reducers. But if one mapper has already yielded half of its values to a given reducer, and then it crashes, we need to rerun the map task. And it's going to rerun from the beginning. And then we need to somehow remember to discard the first n of these values and put the rest in, which is going to add a lot to system complexity and starts introducing things we don't necessarily want. Another question. Don't we still have to deal with that while if a mapper dies during the reduce phase? Yes. However, then all of, well, so 
when the actual user, well, yes and no. When the actual user specified reduction function is running, all of the mappers are by then totally gone. The reducers don't begin running until all of the data is shuffled to that reducer. However, if we were going to start, if a mapper crashes while delivering results to a reducer, then the crash occurs while we are still within the MapReduce library itself, which means that the in MapReduce system has to have some notion of rollback uh, to get the values shuffled to the right reducers. If we were then going to have the iterators uh, in play, now it's possible that this has to happen in the reduction functions themselves, which puts an additional burden on the programmers uh, who are clients of MapReduce. Does that answer the question? Cool. So in general, the added complexity was basically not worth uh, whatever speed up it would give them. Another optimization that was performed was by adding a third set of functions to this, uh, a third class of functions called combiners. And a combiner is effectively a mini reducer. It works just like a reducer in that it takes all of the intermediate values for a given key and operates on them, but it only operates on the values local to one map process. So this can be used to aggregate data before passing it to the reducer to cut down on the bandwidth required for the shuffling process. And so then the output of the combiner would be passed to the reducer instead of the outputs of the mapper on that given machine. Who can tell me when it would be sound to use a reducing function as a combiner? Uh, so word count is a specific example uh, in the back. So, so it says when we don't care about the data specifically, but only when we care about some aggregated value. And this actually generalizes to any time our reducing function is both commutative and associative, then you can factor it up the, uh, up the line. So a function would So if we have some function which uh, runs on two input values of the same type and returns an output value of that type, commutativity is as long as this holds true. And associativity would be if f of x and f of y and z equals f of So in the example of word count, summing across a bunch of ones is, a both, is both commutative and associative. So effectively, we would be reducing on all of the ones into some n on one mapper. We would be reducing all of the ones for the same word into some other value m from a different mapper. And then the reducer for those two mappers would then just add n and m instead of having to get n plus m values that are all one delivered to it. So to conclude the lecture, MapReduce has proven to be a useful abstraction at Google, and it greatly simplifies their large-scale computations. And one of the key things that it sort of demonstrates from the programming languages community side of things is that the functional programming paradigm can be applied to large-scale applications and makes it a lot more straightforward to write a lot of functions that would otherwise uh, have to have a lot of underpinnings associated with them. Uh, to do all of the process synchronization. But what MapReduce does is it factors out all of the synchronization into a bottom layer that can be multiplexed onto several different problems. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the other side of this 
uh, entire system, which is the large backing store called GFS, which, provi which provides reliable and redundant data storage uh, that MapReduce feeds out of and outputs results into. Any questions? Sorry, say that again. After any specific characteristic of a problem that hinders to use MapReduce, uh, I mean, when do you decide that we are going to use MapReduce for a particular problem? So, in order to be able to use MapReduce for a particular problem, um, it can't be something that has a lot of explicit data dependencies, because there's only one point in a map and reduce cycle that uh, would allow data to go from one function to another. So if there's a set of change computations, it would be, be a lot harder to use MapReduce. You'd have to use it in an iterated form. Um, and if there are explicit back and forth handoffs, that pretty much renders MapReduce uh, very unsuitable for the job. But as long as you're applying the same sort of function across a, a vector, so to speak, of input values, then MapReduce works pretty well. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Any other hands from the uh, VCs? Okay. Any hands here? Great. Thank you all.